One metal not taking the hint on interest rate policy is carbon, carbon steel, particularly carbon sheet. Uh, this is basically looking at the same chart and it's almost a mirror image of what you saw on the, on the previous ones, except for the fact that it's even bigger move in the opposite direction. And, and so we're looking at this basically year to date, we've essentially seen carbon prices, carbon sheet prices jump by right around 60 to 65% which is a staggering move in the course of two to three months. Now, uh, if we were wound a prior cup of Joe's, I would say that you know, the I, um, I would say the industry, I would say the futures curves didn't corroborate this move whatsoever. And, and, I, and I would also argue that the United States demand side of the equation, maybe even North, the North American side of the equation, really had the demand picture really hasn't changed all that much to suggest that things are running all that hot. Uh, we're certainly not seeing in aluminum. We're certainly not seeing in stainless. Um, so what in the world's different with carbon? Well, a couple things. One is import levels have come down pretty substantially in the last 12 months. This chart's going all the way back to February of 2020, but you can see that over the last 12 months, uh, imports have dropped in total across flat roll from about 14.2 uh, million tons annualized to about 7.7 .7 million tons annualized. So Let's say, you know, if you average that out, that's three to four, maybe five million tons of a flat rolled import supply that, that is not arriving at the U.S. Sh shores. Um, part of the reason why it's not arriving at the U.S. shores is because people weren't buying it because for the last 12 months, domestic carbon prices have done nothing but free fall. They dropped from $1,800 down to $600 and nobody wanted, nobody wanted that that import ton because the longer you held it, the more, you know, the more out of the money or the more underwater it would be. Um, so nobody was consuming import tons. It also didn't make sense from a pricing standpoint. If, if there wasn't a big enough gap to really reward you to take that, that risk of bringing in steel and, and sitting on it for a couple of months of, of pricing risk, then you're not going to do it. And even up until I would say a month ago, maybe even two, three weeks ago, there wasn't much of a pricing spread. And what I mean by that is, Two, three weeks ago, we had domestic spot prices, let's call it, depending on what mill you're talking to, somewhere around seven or 800 bucks, uh, maybe, a, maybe a touch above that. Well, the domestic, uh, the domestic price in comparison to the import number was actually negative. And what I mean by that is if you try to go out and buy European or Asian pot roll, the landed cost to get it to the United States would be somewhere closer to like, let's say 850 to $900. So there was no competition from another source to really threaten the domestic supply. So that's the first piece of the equation. The other piece of the equation, which I gotta be careful about how, how I say this, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk fairly freely here. Um, the domestic mills, in my opinion, appear to be prioritizing volume output against margin and price. And what I mean by that is this is capacity utilization. So this is the of the mills who can produce steel, this is the percentage that are. So essentially 75% is saying three fourths of the mills or, or you know, of all the mills that are running, they're running at three, you know, 75% capacity or, or three fourths of what they could be producing. Um, that's a fairly constrained number if we look at that, this over a longer period of time, this is a five year chart. 74, 75% is really not a very elevated number. Um, it looks to me like, they are making an effort now that they're a little more consolidated industry. There are really only, let's say, four or five main players within North America. It looks like they're kind of flexing their muscle a little bit to say, why don't we produce a little less steel, particularly given the fact that imports are also low, produce a little less steel. And for each, each ton of steel that we put out, we can make a larger spread on it. We can make more money per ton on it. And it looks like that balancing equation of volume versus margin that for now, it seems as though they've chosen margin. And, and that's why we're seeing prices go higher is because they can. Um, and I know that might not be a very welcomed answer from a lot of customers, but it really is the case that when domestic production is down or, or constrained the way it is, and imports aren't there to threaten it from either a price or volume standpoint, they really kind of get to name their price. And I would say that that's fairly reflective with the number and the rate of the price hikes that we've seen over the last month and a half from the domestic mills who have uh, who have taken prices higher by, again, depending on the mill, probably anywhere from $200 to $300 per ton just in the last month and a half. So we are currently in a situation where 
spot prices are now around $1,100 for certain mills, um, probably closer to 1,000 to 1,050 for, for other mills for hot roll coil. That number would have been 650 to 700 just two, three months ago. Um, now, taking these factors into consideration, the idea that imports are down because price wasn't competitive, well, all of a sudden that equation is flipped. If, if they weren't competitive two months ago because you know imports were at 860, if assuming that number hasn't changed too much, 860 is now pretty darn competitive relative to, to a domestic price. You're talking a couple hundred bucks per ton. It wouldn't surprise me if some buyers start to go offshore again, bring more imports in just as a hedge to say, things have gone a little too far, a little too fast. Um, and, and maybe we need a, a better hedge to bring in, you know, alternative sources of supply so that, so that domestic mills don't have that pricing power to be able to just take things up anytime they want. Because uh, when we look at the cost structure of things, sure, prices have gone up. Iron ore is higher. Uh, certainly iron ore has been supported by the fact that China is getting back to market. Coking coal is rising. And bushling scrap domestically is also rising. Um, if we take the domestic scrap market and we add on some spread, which let's call it 300 bucks in this, in this case, and we say that that's the fair value for producing steel um, or selling steel in the United States, that will put your fair value for steel, even in this inflationary environment, somewhere around $900 for the balance of the year. Well, we're nowhere near $900 on where the futures curve is for steel right now. Uh, the white line is going to be your U.S. futures market. That's basically where the market is suggesting prices could or should go if we took a snapshot as of today. And uh, and what it, what it's suggesting right now is a spread of about, about $300 between kind of that fair market value and where mills, I say mills, this is where the futures market is trading. Uh, the, the mills are, are right around $1,100. Now, one other comment I will make on this, because I, I find it a bit peculiar. As, as it stands right now, the highest domestic mill base price for hot roll coil is $1,100 a short ton, and that's coming from Cliffs. You might be sitting back saying, well, why in the world would May 2023 futures be sitting at $1,215? That's $115 above where the mills are. Um, that could be one of two things. One, it could be a suggestion that the, the market believes that additional price hikes are coming. And that it's, we just haven't seen it yet in the physical market. That may be the case. And maybe there is an additional round from the steel mills to, to take prices further, even from here. Um, the other potential scenario is that if you harken back to some of the things we've seen in nickel, there's a chance that we might be seeing a little bit of a short squeeze in the futures market. And what I mean by that is the idea that the financial future paper paper market um, has deviated currently by about 100 and $120 from where the physical market is, that really doesn't make any sense unless there's an expectation things are going to continue going higher. If there is not an expectation that prices are going to go another $100 higher from where they are today, then steel futures are, are priced in the wrong spot. And the only, reason, the only way that they get priced in the wrong spot is if somebody got caught in a bad position, they had to cover their position, and they were forced to buy back those short positions at a higher price. So I don't want to spend too much time talking about short squeezes, but a bit of a peculiar scenario right now where we're seeing futures so far in excess of where the already, you know, uh, well inflated steel market is. Hey, Nick, is there some is there some expectation built into this about new capacity once it comes online, maybe bringing the later in the year, bringing the price down or. Um, th there's actually a question related to that from one of the uh, some of the audience. The, if, when that happens, do you think production at current mills gets idled in order to keep things tight? There's a chance they may they may try and idle some production. Although some of that production that's coming online is is from domestics as well, so it'd almost mm -hmm. be like you know Robin Peter to pay Paul. It'd be one pocket versus the other. Um, so so yeah, I mean that could happen, but I do think generally speaking, just from an overarching supply standpoint, there is an expectation that. If things are extremely tight right now because of low production domestically and low imports, both of those things can fix themselves. And I think the market currently is expecting that they will fix themselves. It'll just take a couple months. Now, if that sounds a lot like what we saw back in 2021 and 2022 of just mills getting caught back up, it should sound familiar because it's somewhat similar. 
This one might be a little more purposeful because the, the domestic utilization rates are so low that it almost seems like they want to keep them constrained. Um, but as we look at the import market, if, if we're comparing an 860 import number to, uh, to an $1,100 domestic number, I would expect imports to ramp back up a little bit. And that, mm -hmm. should help, that should help to better balance things. And then, yeah, to your point, just domestic expected ramp up in supply, uh, maybe most notably from Sinton, which is uh, Steel Dynamics, that should help to better supply the market as well. Yeah, interesting. And then uh, I mean, this is almost last but not least. So last but, last but not least on the carbon side, um, we've talked about the spread between plate prices and carbon sheet prices. And I, and I think for, no, for a number of months, I've, I've suggested that the spread should tighten. Why well, it has tightened, um, it, it, it uh, evolved in a different way than I thought it would have uh, to the extent that I thought plate prices would have been the one to have declined to a greater extent than carbon sheet prices coming higher. But alas, uh, we were right about part of it, which is that the spread has condensed. Um, it's worth noting that just this morning, Cliffs, which is the same entity who announced uh, a lot of the price hikes on the sheet side, they have announced a $60 per ton plate price, uh, basically effective immediately. So it does look like the plate mills are attempting to hold the line on, on plate up at these levels. Similar to carbon sheet imports, Im import pricing of, of plate is attractive right now. It is very well discounted to where the domestic number is. Um, so I, I would say I'm holding mostly firm on this idea that I think plate prices still have a little room to revert lower. Um, and as we roll as we roll forward another couple of months, I would also probably put my neck on the line to say I would also expect sheet prices uh, to revert lower as supply conditions normalize as well. And, and as we come back to the macroeconomy side of things, you know, I, I think the Federal Reserve, if, if we are, in fact, seeing a higher rate environment for longer, they too would like to see uh, steel prices come back down at later points in the year, uh, just from an inflationary standpoint. Mm 